last week, Stanford Magazine, which is a magazine of the Stanford Alumni Association, goes out to many more people than just who attended Stanford, put out an issue of this. It's a very nice bound magazine of the kind that you would, you know, take the dentist office or, you know, <laughs> on the cover. And inside there's a feature article about psychedelics. I could not believe it at first, mm. but it is essentially a guide to psychedelics. It's not telling you how to do them, but it explains what is ketamine. Now here they're broadly defining psychedelics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the classic psychedelics, right? Psilocybin, muscalina, LSD are included there. Chemical structures, how they're used, the history, clinical trials happening now, known benefits, considerations and risks for all of those drugs, plus ketamine, plus MDMA. I was just shocked, I positively shocked because three years ago, five years ago, certainly 10 years ago, a conversation like this would have been the conversation that would have ended my career yeah. as a university professor. My understanding is that thanks to the incredible work of the group with MAPS and a number of specific laboratories, Matthew Johnson's laboratory, Robin Carthart Harris's laboratory, Roland Griffith's laboratory, and thanks to the philanthropy organized by you and others, truly, and also thanks to the public education efforts of people like Michael Pollan. For sure. We are moving very quickly towards legalization of MDMA as administered by either psychiatrists and or cl licensed clinical psychologists in the US. Psilocybin, probably a longer road, but I'm told that we'll get there, quote unquote. Why am I framing it this way? Well, I'll just be very direct. In high school, I took LSD recreationally several times, had not good experiences. The experiences were far too long. 11, 15 hours. I might have spent my senior prom in an elevator. You know? <laughs> I may or may I, not. You know, cannot confirm I mean, or deny. My, my junior prom, my senior prom was a different story. And I'm not recommending people do this. I actually strongly regret doing that at a time when my brain was plastic. I did not know what I was doing. I didn't know the sourcing. It was a terrible idea. Terrible idea. Even riskier now. Yeah. And keep in mind, folks, I was not a star student. Far from it. It took a lot of years to get my, my act together talked about this before on Tim's podcast, Rich Roll's podcast and others. So, you know, that certainly did not help. And I don't recommend it. I tried psilocybin recreationally a few times. Didn't get much out of it. As an adult, I'm not shy about the fact that I did two and now three of the MAPS appropriate physician guided sessions for trauma using MDMA. I've found it immensely beneficial. I'm happy to talk about how each one of those sessions was different. Again, this is with a physician as part of a, a study. So what I know now is completely different than what I knew two years ago, which is not just based on the legality, but in discussions with Nolan Williams, this incredibly impressive colleague of mine and friend of yours and colleague of yours, really, that the safety profiles on things like MDMA are actually quite high. I was taught that MDMA was neurotoxic. Why was I taught that? Well, there's paper published in Science Magazine, looking at toxicity of MDMA, observing neurotoxic effects. Turns out, what were they looking at? Methamphetamine. Oops, retraction. Yeah, retraction, except that never made the major headlines. Okay, so then you look at the data on psilocybin. Here, I'm just gonna hit the high points because it's not my work. It's the work of Matthew Johnson and of, of Robin Carthart Harris at UCSF. Intractable depression. People who are suicidally depressed. Nothing else works. Talk therapy doesn't work. Antidepressants don't work. TMS doesn't work do two high dose, so it's 25 milligrams of psilocybin that has to be translated for grams of mushrooms, but- It's roughly like the 25 to 30 milligram of psilocybin, synthetic psilocybin be equivalent to, let's just say, a Terrence McKenna heroic dose of five grams. I mean, you're, okay. you're getting enough for escape mm -hmm. velocity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. In upwards of 60%, maybe 70% of these patients that take that are getting substantial and ongoing relief. That's an amazing- result. So much so that the big pharma has moved in and is trying to create non-psychedelic psychedelics to extract the benefits of these drugs that don't induce hallucinations. Instead of raising interesting questions about whether or not the experience under psychedelics is really the trigger for the antidepressant effect, yeah. whether or not it's the insight or not, that's a whole ball of wax. And, and really, I'm not qualified to parse that. That's really the domain of Robin and, and the psychonauts. That's an interesting set of issues. So my stance nowadays is there is a compound out there that seems to have very high safety profiles, very, very high, certainly for psilocybin, that under the appropriate guidance and supervision during and after in this so-called integration phase, one or two dosages of this stuff 
yes, takes people through a phase of anxiety, then a phase of deep introspection. This is also, I learned essential. There are two components that I learned are essential that were surprising to me. One, you have to be in the eye mask. Observing things in your external environment the whole time seems to bypass some of the introspective slash antidepressant effects later. That's interesting to me. It's not just about what you see, what you hear out there. It's really about going inward, this kind of trust, let go. Yeah. It's also important to standardize for trials, right? You can't have people looking at all sorts of different stuff. Somebody's watching Finding Nemo and another one's watching Jaws. Right. (laughs) Exactly. And then the other thing was I learned from Robin recently is that music seems to be a key component. Now they've never teased out music, no music, but having music that starts as he described it in the distance, you know, drums and pacing or something approaching music. Then instrumentals, which raise people's emotional state while they're in the eye mask. And then some transition period out seems to be a critical component of all this and guiding some of the kind of funneling towards deep emotional introspection. I find this incredibly interesting. And again, I would have not felt safe talking about this. Keep in mind a year ago, two years ago, keep in mind that in the late 60s, early 70s, there were professors at Harvard and Stanford mainly that were fired or at least asked to leave for having discussions like this. Yeah. And now Stanford Magazine itself is printing this. And this is also, I'll use this as an opportunity to say this because it's really about the, the listeners. You know, our podcast, Human Lab Podcast is free on all the channels, but we do have a premium channel. I'm not trying to solicit it here, but the premium channel is designed to, we do AMAs and things of that sort. Transcripts are available to those folks to raise revenue for research dollars for exciting work. And we have a donor that's very, been very generous to do a match for that money. And we're giving money only to studies working on humans, not animal studies. And two of the major areas that we're supporting are the sorts of work that Nolan's lab is doing, and Nolan in particular, to combine transcranial magnetic stimulation with psychedelics and these yeah, sorts that's of things. that's great. I didn't know that about, about the premium option. Yeah, that's really what the premium channel is designed for. Yeah, that's great. Again, I'm going to say this again. People are going to think that I'm just here, you know, kissing up to to Tim, but I'm I'm doing that over text all the time anyway, because this is yet another example where you got into science philanthropy early. You reached out to your connects. You were very vocal about what you felt was powerful and it worked for you and what you'd been observing. And I am absolutely clear. I've said this on Twitter. I'll say it again. When we look back in five years, 10 years, a hundred years, there's going to be a small subset of individuals for whom the transition of psychedelics from these like niche communities, hippie communities, carpet flyers, everything from devil's weed, you know, craziness to true, truly effective compounds for treating psychiatric illness. You're going to be on that list. Roland's going to be on that list. Matthew's going to be on that list. Pollen's going to be on that list. Yeah, Robin's going to be on that Roland list. Roland for sure also. You know, and Nolan, I think, is going to be on that list. There's going to be a small subset of people that we're going to go, listen, research takes money. It takes focus. It takes a bravery. And it also takes the willingness to like take something that has been looked at as just like drugs you know, and turn it into something that's therapeutically meaningful. So yeah, we're just, all I'm trying to do is you know raise some dollars through the premium channel. That's what we've been doing to pump into research studies. And so what, I mean, you can tell I'm super excited by all this. What I see happening now is that soon MDMA for trauma is going to be available to the countless numbers of people out there that have trauma. And I don't mean just take MDMA and have a great time. I'm, I mean, people developing empathy for themselves. I mean, people really working through the barbed wire stuff of their past, much of which they had no control over, that sets this transgenerational thing that's been going on for so long. I mean, really, you know, you, you've used the language, you know, bend the arc of history, like these compounds are going to bend the arc of history in the right direction. And if people out there are listening and saying, okay, well, this is like recreational stuff and it's very precarious. I do not know a single major, let's just call them what they are, CEO or company founder. We're talking about people at the kind of billionaire level that are hyper creative, hyper creative and hyper functional in their life. We're not talking about mystic creatives. We're talking about people who I don't want to name names, but Every single one of them already knows this is true because they've all done this stuff already. And I was kind of late to the train because I had such a terrible experience in my high school years and saw so many friends dead, suicide, drug addicts in jail, like wrecked their lives. I had so many challenges taking myself from essentially a loser with nowhere to go to, you know, a trajectory within academia and taking good care of my body that I was like, no drugs, no drugs. 
I don't even put psychedelics in the category of drugs. And here I'm lumping MDMA in there, provided it's done with a licensed physician or clinician who can guide this stuff. It's been immensely beneficial for 